The Puritans were people of the book. Since the Bible contained the irrevocable word of God, the Puritans believed that truly important matters should be written. They wrote their compact on the Mayflower and en route to these shores. Later, their descendants, although far from being as Calvinistic, nevertheless believed that the United States could be united only by means of a written document, a constitution, a compact, in other words, between the government and the people, to be altered only with the consent of the governed and in a united, orderly manner. This expectation, as we know, did not anticipate a United States governed as we are today governed, according to the whims of pressure groups and of any group seated on a federal bench. The founders did not expect the federal judges to rule according to penumbras not stated in the Constitution, according to implied powers discerned by individuals with supernal sight, or according to majority rule as interpreted by journalists. They did not anticipate a Supreme Court that would decide after over a century and a half that all laws against abortion, common to the entire West until a few decades ago, would be ruled unconstitutional in this land. They did not anticipate that the Supreme Court would decide that to teach elementary school children in public schools that many of our leading scientists believe that a supreme being created all life would be unconstitutional. Such sweeping decisions obeyed by our government and all its tens of thousands of branches are presumed to be based upon a document held in awe by the courts and people alike. No document has been more fulsomely praised, more often held aloft, more often cited, more often described as a work of genius, as a masterpiece emerging from a group of wonderful men, as a marvel of the ages, worthy of admiration for all time. Yet six of our leading historians, men who hold high academic posts and leading universities, in a recent combined work titled The Great Republic, A History of the American People, held the Constitution and its founding generation up to scorn. In the opinion of these modern American historians, the Constitution was an effort by the gentry to maintain control of the new nation. Hence through the Constitution, wrote Balin, Davis, Donald, Thomas, Weeb, and Wood, the Federalists hoped to restore traditional gentry dominance of the government and to escape the confusion and instability created by the wrong sort of people exercising political power in the state legislators during the 1780s. This is, of course, the Marxist theory of history, the class struggle explanation in which men act only to protect their class positions and in its defense. It is today expressed by recognized American historians and academics using well-worn phrases from modern liberal ideology published by an old and recognized house. The disdain of these professors for the founding generation was clear when they wrote, like the self-molded, impenetrable character of George Washington, who was the first president, 1789 to 96, and more a monument than a person, the entire Federalist era seems to be a sheer act of will in the face of contrary social developments. Because the Federalists stood in the way of democracy as it was emerging in the United States, they have become heretics in the story of the developing faith. They thought they were creating a classically heroic state, and they attempted everywhere to symbolize those classical aims, but they left only a legacy of indecipherable icons, unread poetry, and a proliferation of Greek and Roman temples. They despised political parties, yet parties nonetheless emerged, shattering the remarkable harmony of 1790 and fomenting one of the most divisive and passionate eras in American history. 
By the early 19th century, Alexander Hamilton, the brilliant leader of the Federalists, was not alone in his despairing conclusion that this American world was not made for me. This gloating over Hamilton's disappointment, this ridicule of Washington, this scornful description of the original Constitution as indecipherable icons, unread poetry, and a proliferation of Greek and Roman temples is not what the average American thinks that Ivy League schools teach, and certainly not in keeping with the public myth about the Constitution. If we were told the facts of American history, however, we would not be surprised to find ourselves where we are, on the edge of a totalitarian society. If we had been taught the facts of our national history, we would not now be on the rim of this precipice. If we knew our real path better, we would more easily recognize our present danger. The Constitution, with its 26 amendments, coupled with the decisions of the Supreme Court, reflects the changes of our national history. If the Court's contemporary decisions horrify us, let us be remembered that this situation is not new and has grown to its present dimensions only through the lethargy, ignorance, and illusions of the Christian community, which watched silently while our liberties had been progressively enchained. The professors disdained the original Constitution because the men at Philadelphia deliberately rejected the idea of democracy. Their educations, based upon studies of ancient Greece and Rome, had shown them how previous republics had collapsed under the pressures of special interests and the subsequent rise of tyrants. They determined to create a structure that would avoid these historical failures. Therefore, they worked with two images in mind, history and the English experience with both kings and commons. In their view, as in the view of their Protestant forebears, both needed to have authority, but limited authority. They distrusted both kings and the mob, believing, as did the ancient Greeks, that there was no essential difference between being devoured by a single lion or nibbled to death by a hundred mice. They put the issue in large terms. They believe that no man or men, no government, should have complete and total sovereign power on earth since that already belonged to God. For men to claim or use such power put them into conflict with God and was blasphemous. A people that allowed such a usurpa usurpation would therefore suffer both from such a tyrant and from God. The Federalists also had, in the society in which they lived, spectacular evidence of human limitations. The confederation the colonies created to fight against Great Britain had left the 13 states free to issue paper money to pay war debts. This led to a flood of paper totaling nearly $400 million by the early 1780s, counting both congressional and state issues. In addition to this financial disarray, the former colonists had developed a deep distrust of all governments, all officialdom. The war had resulted in confiscations and arbitrary official behavior on both sides, left a residue of lost property and worthless money, crippled veterans, and a people accustomed to violence. Some responded by pressing state and local legislators and officials toward obedience instead of governance. Others to the creation of special extra-official committees and groups to manage public affairs outside official channels. Various actions, such as those of Colonel Lynch of Virginia against Tories and outlaws, from which the term Lynch Law arose, disrupted orderly processes. Extra-legal bodies appeared to handle all sorts of problems. 
One result was that parts of western Massachusetts were in turmoil from 1774 through the 1780s as mob-like committees of debtor farmers periodically closed the courts to protect themselves from creditors. If the authors of the Constitution distrusted democracy, therefore, they had both historical and contemporary reasons. Being Englishmen steeped in English history, they also knew the origin of English liberties and how hard they had been won. With these examples in mind, they created a remarkably succinct document and governmental structure. They decided upon a strong executive who would not be selected by the people, but by officials elected solely for the purpose by the people, electors who were not members of existing governmental bodies. The executive officer, a president, would not even be encumbered by an executive council accepting of his own choosing. He would be supreme commander of the armed forces, would make all appointments to both the executive and judicial branches, would serve for four years and be eligible for re-election as long as he lived. Patrick Henry, no admirer of the Constitution, observed that this official could easily become a king. He was right. The founders thought of the president as an elected king. They could not conceive of a society worthy of the name that did not have an executive. To ensure, however, that the people's representatives would determine who held this power, the constitutional authors decided that the number of electors would equal the combined representatives and senators from each state. If the electors failed to reach a majority, a final selection from the top five candidates would be made by the House of Representatives, with each state having only one vote. That's a long way from a plebiscite. Nevertheless, it was decided that the members of the House should be chosen on the basis of population and not on property or landed wealth. In the determination of population, slaves, for the first time in all recorded history, were to be listed, though only as three-fifths of a free citizen. It's clear that the founders also foresaw the inevitable end of slavery by their later provision that the importation of slaves should be ended. In other respects, they saw the House as the equivalent of commons without the unlimited power of commons. The Senate resembled the House of Lords in having longer terms than being composed of men selected by state legislatures and not directly by the people. Some of the Philadelphia delegates thought even this gave too much power to the states, but they were unable to convince the majority. There was, in contrast, no argument against an independent judiciary nor against having the judges insulated from pressure by unlimited terms, quote, during good behavior, end quote. When the subject of whether the federal court could set aside acts of Congress, Madison said in 1788 that such a power would make the Judiciary Department paramount, in fact, to the legislature, which was never intended and can never be proper. On the other hand, they assumed that the Constitution might be changed in the future and created machinery for such changes to be peacefully made. Amendments, they wrote, would be submitted to specially elected state legislatures for ratification and accomplished by a majority of nine out of the 13 states. Objections arose from anti-federalists against the Constitution. The gist of their arguments was the president had too much power and that a national government would inevitably override state and local authorities. They prophesied the rise of a vast federal bureaucracy that would absorb all authority. These arguments, as we now know, were eminently logical. They were based at the time in the terms with which the Enlightenment generation was familiar as part of the logic of sovereignty, 
a principle of 18th century political reasoning often used against the colonies with great effect by Britain. This was the belief that no state could long possess two legislatures but must inevitably have one illimitable, indivisible law-making authority. This debate should be taught in every American school. So far as I know, it is not taught in any. The authors of the Constitution, as we all know, won the debate. They had more skill in argument, having rehearsed all the arguments pro and con at Philadelphia, employed the rhetoric of liberty, were prominent men in the nation, natural aristocrats, so to speak, and had nearly all but a handful of the newspapers on their side. The most effective arguments mounted, that numerous rights were not enumerated, were met by acceptance of that demand. The result was that Madison drew up the first ten amendments. After that, ratification was rapid amid general enthusiasm. But the ink was hardly dry when great efforts arose to break the limits of the Constitution. Not financially. Hamilton's efforts to straighten out the tangle of American finances succeeded, though they are outside the province of this essay to describe. We are, honoring the Constitution, concerned with what happened to it in terms of political liberty and Christian principles. Let it suffice to say that the Constitution expressly limited the currency of the United States to coin and gave the federal government a monopoly in creating coins. In, seven, in the 1790s, the anti-federalists resented Hamilton's ideas argued against this creation of a federal debt. They also resented the tone and elegance of the Federalists, the effort to introduce pageantry into the presidency, the growth of taxes and the aristocracy of the Senate, the distancing of pressure groups inherent in the federal structure. Passionate disputes raged over foreign policy, over the Federalist reconciliation with Great Britain, and whether or not to support revolutionary France. In this period, Hamilton secretly passed information about the plans of the American government to London. Jefferson and several later ministers to France sought to undermine the Federalists by feeding information to the French. The Federalists confronted with demands that the new government be dismantled that its authority be reduced, and alarmed at the increasing coarseness of political argument, linked this to arguments floated by the French Revolution. They enacted the Alien and Sedition Act, which lengthened the period of naturalization, gave the President extraordinary powers to deal with aliens, provided the government with authority to punish as sedition libels against federal officials. In response, the Republicans in control of the legislatures of Virginia and Kentucky drew up resolutions drawn by Madison and Jefferson respectively, proclaiming the right of the states to judge the constitutionality of federal acts and to interpose themselves between the citizens and the unconstitutional actions, as they termed them, of the federal government. During the administrations of Washington and Adams, the Federalists made all judicial appointments. They appointed Federalist justices. Not a single Republican justice occupied a bench. This set up a clamor in the Republican Party press claiming that the Federalist judges abused the sedition actions and favored special interests. After the Federalists lost the election of 1800, the lame duck Federalist Congress passed a new Judiciary Act creating a system of federal circuit courts and broadening the jurisdiction of the federal courts. This was the first of what would be a series of efforts to control, in one or another form, the federal judiciary. Before leaving office, therefore, President John Adams hastily appointed a number of judges 
including John Marshall as Chief Justice of the United States. Jefferson, in 1801, was convinced that the remains of federalism had retired into the judiciary as a stronghold, and from that battery all the works of republicanism are to be beaten down and erased. This view was communicated to the new Congress, which repealed the Federalist Judiciary Act altogether. This destroyed the circuit courts, and for the first and only time in American history, abrogated the tenure of some federal judges. Some members of Congress wanted to add a constitutional amendment to control the judiciary. But Congress as a whole finally seized upon impeachment as a means of removing judges for high crimes and misdemeanors. Then, as if to show that this threat was real, the Republicans in the House proceeded to impeach and the Senate to convict and remove John Pickering from the Federal District Court of New Hampshire, though he had committed neither crimes nor misdemeanors. Off the record, we might say he was an alcoholic. Next, the Republicans turned against Justice Samuel Chase of the Supreme Court. Chase had committed no crimes, but was overbearing and haughty. Impeached by the House, he was convicted by the Senate, but not by the necessary two-thirds majority. This made it clear to the federal judiciary that it could be injured. It also made clear that men in positions of power were pushing against constitutional limits, written or not. John Marshall, therefore, walked cautiously, but nevertheless steadily advanced the power of the Supreme Court. Instead of confronting Congress by declaring the repeal of the Judiciary Act of 1801 to be unconstitutional, Marshall achieved the point obliquely by saying that since the American people regarded the written Constitution as the fundamental and paramount law of the nation, it follows that a law repugnant to the Constitution, such as part of the Judiciary Act of 1789, is void and that courts, as well as other departments, are bound by that instrument. Later, John Marshall openly declared that the Supreme Court had the right to declare acts of Congress unconstitutional. That right, asserted in Marbury v. Madison, was not challenged at the time. It's interesting to note, however, that although Marshall remained Chief Justice through five administrations, he never again asserted the court's right to make such a determination. Under Marshall, the court expanded its authority over the states in a series of decisions. Martin v. Hunter's Lessee, 1816, and Cohen v. Virginia, 1812, established the court's right to review and reverse decisions of state courts involving interpretations of federal law and the Constitution. In other cases, the Supreme Court nullified state law on the grounds they violated the Constitution. President Jefferson didn't think that the Supreme Court was superior to the executive branch. Throughout his life, he denied the exclusive authority of the judiciary to decide which laws were unconstitutional. Such a monopoly, he said in 1804, would make the judiciary a despotic branch. In defending the Constitution in the Federalist Paper No. 78, Hamilton wrote that the judiciary's role as reviewer did not by any means suppose the superiority of the judicial to the legislative power. It only supposes that the power of the people is superior to both, and that where the will of the legislature declared in its statutes stands in opposition to that of the people, declared in the Constitution, the judges ought to regulate their decisions by the fundamental laws rather than by those which are not fundamental. Yet when Marshall placed the court on record as having the power to set aside judicial acts, there was no clamor against his ruling. Perhaps the claim of the courts of Kentucky and Virginia to have similar power had reduced the heat of the argument or inured many minds to it, or perhaps it was taken for granted that such a power would not be lightly used.
Certainly no American citizen in the early 19th century could have anticipated a time when the Supreme Court of the United States would express an animus against Christianity. Long before our present situation, however, Congress, the President, and the Court struggled for preeminence. The tides of power wavered according to the mood of the country and the skill of the contenders. A dispassionate review of these collisions simply underscores the fact that men determine how rules are applied on earth. All the agitation of the abolitionists, for instance, did not deter Chief, Chief Justice Roger Taney from coming to the conclusion on behalf of a Supreme Court dominated by Southerners that the Supreme Court would not declare the institution of slavery invalid. To assume that the Taney decision led to the Civil War is, however, a simplification. What is more to the point is that during that war, President Lincoln decided that the nation could not both conduct a war and obey the Constitution. Lincoln suspended the right of habeas corpus, curtailed the freedom of the press, refused citizens the right to appeal to the courts, and had them tried, convicted, and imprisoned by army court-martials without counsel. The Supreme Court in that period, finding that its orders were ignored, retired for the duration of the conflict. Lincoln had, of course, the rationale that treason was rampant, that he was atop a powder keg in the North, that the emergency justified extreme measures. But the failure to analyze how the nation's liberties were lost during that emergency seriously distorts the average understanding of Abraham Lincoln's character and determination. This lack of historical analysis, in which Lincoln's refusal to, and to emancipate the slaves of the North, his proclamation freed only slaves held by the resistant Confederacy, is generally glossed in our textbooks, is only part of the shading of our history that has given rise to so much misunderstanding. Many Northerners continue to have slaves during the Civil War, including General Grant's wife. Meanwhile, the Confederacy reached the point where it drafted black soldiers. Such contrast between myth and reality runs throughout our history, as throughout all humanity. They appear in remarkable behavior shortly after the end of the Civil War in the wake of the Lincoln assassination. The president was not popular in abolitionist circles and his violent death propelled Andrew Johnson, a southerner, into the executive power. Congress was controlled by abolitionists, whom the historians have renamed radical Republicans. These were convinced that Lincoln was murdered as part of a Southern conspiracy to revenge the results of the war. Putting such conspiracy theories aside, the surface facts are that Booth and his companions planned to murder the President, Secretary of State Seward, and possibly Secretary of War Stanton. In the event, attacks were mounted only upon Lincoln and Seward. Lincoln was killed, but Seward only wounded. Seven men and one woman were tried for these crimes. The trial was in the flavor of the times, which had been coarsened by a great and brutal war. The defendants were denied counsel and held in solitary confinement in dark cells and forced to wear leather hoods that covered their heads and faces. They were tried inside the grounds of the Washington Arsenal Penitentiary only 22 days after the arrest of Mrs. Surratt whose crime seems to have been to operate a boarding house where the men roomed. During the trial, the male defendants were, in their hoods, handcuffed to a metal bar. The judges were three major generals, four brigadiers, and several lesser officers. None had any legal background or training. Of the three prosecutors, one had experience in wartime prosecutions of persons accused of being Southern sympathizers. One was John Bingham of Ohio, described as a master of partisan speech, clever retort, and loose rhetoric, who later played, played a large role in the prosecution of President Andrew Johnson. 
The trial was well underway when, in answer to many protests, defense counsel was allowed. Reverend E. Johnson, a prominent attorney from Maryland, attempted to defend Mrs. Surratt, but was subjected to such insults from the judges that he withdrew. In the end, two of the men and Mrs. Surratt were convicted and hanged. Three men received life at hard labor, and one received six years. If any constitutional rights existed at that time, they did not seem to apply to these defendants. After that, the abolitionists in Congress really began to roll. Their program was to disfranchise the white citizens of the South and enfranchise their former slaves. Southern whites were to be removed from all positions of authority. Large estates were to be confiscated and redistributed to blacks black rule governments to be installed in southern states. When President Johnson opposed this policy, he encountered serious opposition in Congress and in his cabinet. Secretary of War Stanton, who had supervised the trial and treatment of the Lincoln assassins, played an especially duplicitous role by conniving with the congressional quack behind the president's back. The power of this clack was enhanced by its victory in the elections of 1866 and was focused by Thaddeus Stevens, a most remarkable demagogue, sadly neglected by his intellectual heirs in the American Historical Association. Stevens is worthy of concentrated study as an exemplar of racism in the name of anti-racism. Congress under Stevens enacted a Tenure in Office Act which forbade the President to dismiss, without the consent of Congress, any executive branch official appointed with the consent of Congress. Then, assuming that his new expansion of congressional authority might be challenged in court, Congress passed several bills affecting the judiciary. One would expand the number of justices on the Supreme Court, Another forbade the court to make a constitutional ruling with less than a majority of the justices. That set the stage to trap President Johnson. Johnson, discovering Stanton's duplicity, sprung the trap by dismissing the Secretary of War without the permission of Congress. Stanton then appealed to the Senate against what he said was a violation of the law by the President and barricaded himself in his office. While Stanton enjoyed restaurant meals sent into his office, the House proceeded to impeach the President for violating the Tenure in Office Act. The Senate then sat in judgment. After long harangues, the issue came to a vote, and the President was convicted, but by only one vote, short of a two-thirds majority. Hence, he was not removed from office, and Ben Wade, whom the abolitionists had selected to succeed him, was deeply disappointed. But to deny that the abolitionists won the battle would be impossible, for although Johnson remained in office, his authority was deeply undercut, and the abolitionists proceeded to their program of humiliating and occupying the South. That program, ironically called the Reconstruction, sowed the seeds of dissension for decades to come. More than that, it revealed the ease with which a demagogic faction could set aside the Constitution. In fact, while they were in control, the abolitionists pushed through two amendments to the Constitution in the absence of the southern states granting rights to newly liberated slaves that are now the expansion for that are now the basis for the expansion of federal authority into every crevice and nook of the nation. Major alterations of the Constitution quickened during the twentieth century. Of these, the sixteenth amendment may be the most significant. The original purpose of the Constitution was to establish a nation in which all citizens would be equal under law. To tax one citizen more than another is to upend that principle, to make it legal to treat citizens unequally. The 16th Amendment 
popularized in the name of soaking the rich, has now been expanded to soak all but the very poor. Furthermore, it is the basis of inquiries into private life once held inviolate and is now the charter for the most feared governmental agency in the land. In the same area, Congress created a Federal Reserve System with more power than either of the two banks of the United States authorized to create paper money divorced from intrinsic value, convertible to nothing. Paper money, the major reason for the Philadelphia Convention, is back as our currency. That we have returned to such a state, despite armies of economists and historians, is a testament to the enduring nature of folly. If it can be said that the founders would have been appalled by the 16th Amendment, what can be said about the fact that the same Supreme Court that ruled the income tax unconstitutional is the same court that later ruled it constitutional? The 7th Amendment, which provides for the direct, the 17th, rather, Amendment, which provides for the direct election of United States Senators, accomplished what not even the Civil War could achieve, the reduction of the states to mere localities. As long as state legislatures could elect senators, Congress was careful to treat the states as powers worthy of respect. The senators were, in effect, ambassadors from the states. The 17th Amendment reduced them to another branch of the commons, and the character of senators changed accordingly. The most far-reaching and continuous constitutional changes came, however, with administrations from Theodore Roosevelt through Franklin Roosevelt and since. Through these years, both Congress and the executive created agencies authorized to combine the powers that the founders once deliberately held separate, the power to enact law, the power to administer laws, and to adjudicate laws. Of course, regulatory agencies do not claim to be enacting laws. They simply issue regulations. But the regulations have the force of law. And the agencies that issue such regulations have the authority to oversee their application and to punish violations. The citizens can, if they are told, appeal to the courts if they believe that the agency has overstepped its authority or made a mistake. But the courts do not hear such appeals until the agency's internal labyrinth is first completely and expensively traversed. These agencies today license, regulate, and administrate all the activities of the American people. The courts have determined that these agencies are unconstitutional by remaining silent about them. Thus, bureaucrats rule through a fourth centralized branch of government, from offices whose powers are centralized, while we are still told that our government consists of divided powers. The fourth bureaucratic branch of government has accomplished, without constitutional amendments, without disturbing the facade of our original government, what the founders believed they had permanently barred from the land and what they fought a war against. There is also the rather terrible point, courts no longer keep to their own decisions. They shift according to the pressures placed upon them. The Constitution has become a true marvel of the world, for it is now elasticized and can be stretched or contracted to cover or not to cover whatever the federal courts decide. The fact that the courts need not be consistent allows, of course, infinite whim. No right, no procedure, no citizen or group of citizens can predict the outcome of any court case in our judiciary. Nothing in the Constitution is what it seems to be. Nothing is fixed. Nothing is sure. The Fifth Amendment, for instance, says that no citizen can be forced to testify against himself. But the courts have decided that the Fifth Amendment can only protect the defendant who refuses to answer all questions. To attempt to use the Fifth Amendment selectively is to lose the right. 
What sort of right can be lost? Surely a very shaky one. If a witness stubbornly insists upon his Fifth Amendment right, the courts have handed prosecutors a weapon to force testimony, immunity from prosecution. Such a witness can admit any crime, including multiple murders, and go free if he names his accomplices. Congress has refined the immunity concept even further. A witness may be offered limited immunity. This means that he cannot be indicted on the basis of his own testimony unless corroboration is discovered through a means he has not described. Whether this applies to evidence gathered as an indirect result of his testimony is yet to be made clear. At one time, Americans knew about the High Commission of England and the reigns of the Tudors and the early Stuarts. Witnesses were summoned and had to appear. They were ordered to take an oath to answer all questions truthfully, and if they demanded to know the scope and nature of such questions in advance, were held in contempt and sent to prison. This was one of the causes of the English Revolution. It is now an accepted and common practice before our Congress. Witnesses before the High Commission were not allowed counsel, for the Commission said it was not holding a trial. Our Congress says the same and calls it an inquiry or a hearing. The High Commission argued that it did not apply capital punishment, neither does Congress. The Commission said that it was not a court, so does our Congress, but it can humiliate, disgrace, and ruin. The Christians once knew the names of the martyrs who appeared before the High Commission and their arguments. Americans no longer recall the period and have lost sight of the reasons as well as the history of the Fifth Amendment. Of course, we still have a Constitution. We are, but we are beginning to learn or relearn what the framers of the Constitution knew when they wrote it, that parchment barriers, as Madison termed them, are poor protections against overbearing majorities. Even an absolute constitutional prohibition can dissolve in the event of an emergency or public alarm. Even the Reverend Samuel Stillman, defending the Constitution during the debates on ratification, admitted such fears were realistic. Who are the Congress, he asked? They are ourselves, the men of our choice but he admitted that a constitution could not by itself protect a nation against tyranny. Nothing could safeguard the liberties of the people unless they watched their own liberties, he said. Nothing written on paper can do this. Many Americans don't seem to know that. They expect their liberties to be guarded for them as though officialdom plays the role of parents and the people are children. To a great extent, I think that these illusions have been fostered by a sloganized history that glides smoothly over all harsh facts. The Bible, as every Christian knows, contains the history of an ancient people without disguise. Their sins of pride, envy, lust, all the cardinal sins are plainly stated. Yet that history, suffused with the presence, with the presence and the majesty of God, has lifted the hearts and enlarged the minds of this civilization, and enlarged it to a high peak in the long, painful annals of the human race. If the history of the American people were as simply and honestly narrated, it will have the same effect. For the hand of God is with us as surely as it was with the ancient Hebrews. His presence is eternal. In no part of the world is it absent. The history of the Constitution of the United States, like all other aspects of our national history, reflects the changes in American society and government through the years. To understand these changes, it is essential to understand that history as it was, and ourselves as we are, Yet, we have as a nation failed to confront the truth of our history in many important respects. To acknowledge truth requires recognition that original sin exists in us all, 
and that all discoverable facts must be confronted in all circumstances. This should not lead to recriminations or condemnation. Everyone is fallible and all men error. God allows error. Men should not deny to one another what God allows. Recognition of error is, after all, the first step in its repair. The present decline of the United States, visible on all sides and blared throughout the world, can only be checked and reversed if Christianity is restored to its early prominence among us. Let us therefore abandon the legend that the Constitution is is intact and set about the task of constitutional restoration.